All right, here we go. So welcome back, everybody. This is now week 15 of class, so we're getting very close to the end. Um, a few reminders. You have test number three coming up a week from today. That's going to cover gravity, which we finished going over a few weeks ago, and momentum, which we're currently on. But we're going to finish this topic by the end of the week. And after that, there's no new material. Okay, so after you take test three, uh, we're going to spend the last two days in lecture before finals just doing a review. Okay, and actually, um, because there's no new material after the third test, I'm just going to give you a break and not give you any homework after that. So this homework assignment right here is the last one, homework 15. And that quiz you turned in, that's the last quiz. Okay, so very few things coming up. So um. Anyway, make sure you get a copy of the week 15 worksheet. That's up here. Week 15 homework is due next Tuesday. Again, that's the day of our test. All right, if you haven't done so already, uh, turn in homework 14 and the quiz that was take home from last week, okay? So uh, with that said, let's get back into the lecture. So we were talking about collisions when we, laughed, uh, uh, when we left off last time. And one thing that happens during collisions is that momentum is conserved. So you have just as much momentum in your incoming objects that are about to collide as you do with the outgoing objects that have bounced off each other and have finished colliding. But there's more than one way that can happen, as we showed, right? You can have collisions where the objects just kind of stick together, or you can have objects which come in and bounce off each other and they don't lose any kinetic energy. And that's really the difference between elastic versus inelastic collisions, okay? So in an elastic collision, that means the amount of kinetic energy your objects had before colliding is exactly the same as they have after colliding. So they don't, they don't lose any kinetic energy in the process of the collision. And what I'm gonna do here is show you a slow motion video of a collision that's pretty close to elastic. That's the golf ball basically bouncing off of this wall. We say it's elastic because if you compare the kinetic energy of the ball coming in and the kinetic energy of the ball going out, which basically just depends on the speed, right? As long as we're going just as fast coming in as we are going out, then we have the same amount of kinetic energy, right? In each case. Now, it's not exactly the same, as it turns out. You do lose a little bit of kinetic energy in any real collision, so nothing is perfectly elastic in the real world, but this is an example of something that's pretty close to it, okay? So if we take a closer look at what's going on during the collision, you had kinetic energy coming in. It's actually temporarily uh, converted to a type of energy which we call elastic potential energy. It's the same type of energy that's stored in a band when you stretch it like this, but it goes right back to kinetic energy after it's done bouncing off the wall, okay? So that would be an elastic collision. Here's an inelastic collision. You have two cars, they collide head on, and all of their kinetic energy is gone after the collision, right? They both come to a stop. And so what that means is that kinetic energy that they initially had coming in towards each other is going somewhere else. It's converted to some other type of energy. And if you think about it, well, what happens when two cars crash like this? You hear a loud sound, some heat is actually generated in this process. Windows smash, uh, the body of the cars get deformed. All of that takes energy to happen. So that's where the energy is going in an inelastic collision, All right, It's going to, Things like heat, sound, and deforming the objects, okay? So that's the difference. Now, what I wanna do next is derive this result that you see in the box, okay? So it turns out with elastic collisions, the math can get a little bit complicated. So we're gonna restrict ourselves to one-dimensional collisions. That is where all the motion happens along a straight line. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a two-body elastic collision in one dimension. Okay, let's break that down. Two bodies are involved in the collision. Two objects, we'll call them A and B. 
Okay, it's elastic, remember? That means kinetic energy is the same before and after the collision if we add it up between the two objects. And then finally, one dimension, that's just one dimensional motion. It all happens, it all happens along a straight line, okay? So, because everything's happening in one dimension, that's what we're focusing on here, uh, we don't need to worry so much about vectors. You guys remember, if we have one dimensional motion, how do we handle the direction something is moving in? We just say, it's positive velocity if you're moving in one direction, it's negative velocity if you're moving in the opposite direction, okay? So we'll take that point of view, where let's say if something's moving to the right, we'll consider that a positive velocity. If something's moving to the left, we'll consider that a negative velocity, okay? So that's the situation. We have two objects, mass A, mass B. They come in with initial velocities VA and VB, okay? And then after they collide, and they bounce off of each other. Then they have final velocities VA prime and VB prime, okay? So not only is momentum gonna be conserved, that's always gonna be the case for these types of collisions, okay? But also kinetic energy. So let's look at these two different equations that we get by saying momentum is conserved and by saying the total kinetic energy is conserved, okay? For momentum, it goes like this. Initially, we have MA times VA, that's the momentum of the first object, and then we add to that MB, VB for the second object. And then we set that equal to MA, VA prime for the final momentum of the first object, and then add to that MB, VB prime, that's the final momentum of the second object. Okay, so that's just saying the total momentum here is the same as the total momentum here after the collision. So we've seen that before. What about energy? So remember, we have this new quantity. We learned about this in the last lecture. It's called kinetic energy. What's the formula for it? It's one half times mv squared, okay? So if we're saying the total kinetic energy of these two objects right here is the same as their total kinetic energy after they collide, this is what the equation we end up with is. So I have one half ma va squared, that's the kinetic energy of this object coming in, plus one half mb, vb squared, kinetic energy of that object coming in. And then it's just the same thing on this side of the equation, but with primes, because we're talking about the final speeds, okay? So both of these things are gonna hold true. Both of these equations are gonna have to hold true if we have a perfectly elastic collision, okay? So we good on that so far? Perfectly elastic collision, you get these two equations. What I'm gonna show you, we're gonna do this on paper, it's a quick exercise, is if we combine these two equations, which together kind of looks like a lot, how would I solve that? You can actually make it something simpler, which is the equation in the box, okay? So if we take these two together, do a little algebra, we can get this equation in the box, which you can use whenever you have a two-body elastic collision in one dimension, okay? So that's a result we're gonna use from time to time. All right, so just copying down what we originally stated, we have a momentum equation, which states MA times VA plus MB times VB equals MA VA prime plus MB VB prime. Here's what I'm gonna do with that. I'm going to simply rearrange the terms a little bit where I want to put all the A stuff on the left side of the equation, and I'm going to put all the B stuff on the right side, okay? So that means I have to subtract MABA prime to move it over here on the left. So I'll have MA times VA minus VA prime once I do that. And then again, I want all the B stuff on the right side. So that means I have to subtract off this term, which is MBVB. So when I do that, I have MB times VB prime minus VB. So I haven't done anything special, just reshuffled the terms, okay? Just reshuffling the terms gives you that. All right, next, let's look at our energy equation. 
this says 1 half MA VA squared plus 1 half MB VB squared is equal to a half MA VA prime squared that's not 12 that's prime squared plus a half MB VB prime squared all right what can I do to simplify this equation Yeah, so there's a half in every single term. Might as well just drop that off. And let's do the same game we did before, where we try to put all the A terms on one side and then all the B terms on the other side, okay? So I have MA times VA squared already on the left side. But if I subtract off this, I'll have minus MA VA prime squared. So I'll have minus VA prime squared like this when I factor out the mass, okay? On the other side, again, I'm trying to put all the B stuff on the right side. So I'm going to have MB times VB prime squared, which is already right there. And then if I subtract off this term, which is MB VB squared, this is what I get. Okay? So you with me so far? Just reshuffling things. All right, does anyone remember? Um, there's kind of a way, if I have a term like this, where it's something squared minus something else squared, I can kind of expand it out in terms of two expressions in parentheses. So here, let me, let me show you how I would do this for this term in parentheses. I would say MA times, I can write this whole thing now as VA minus VA prime multiplied by VA plus VA prime. So if you FOIL this thing out, you can show that it's what we started with over here, okay? So I'm kind of expanding it out. Make sense? And I can do the same exact thing over here, right? I can expand it out as MB times VB prime minus VB multiplied by VB prime plus VB. Again, if you FOIL this out, you can show that it's what we started with on the previous line, okay? So I'm going to underline two things. This and this. Okay, this says MA VA minus VA prime. That looks kind of familiar. That's what we had up here from the momentum equation, right? And then this says MB, VB prime minus VB. That again is just this side of that same equation, okay? So in other words, you see the two terms that I underline are the same thing, right? What does that mean? They cancel out, okay? They cancel. And that's where we get the much simpler equation that I was trying to show you in the first place, which is VA plus VA prime equals VB prime plus VB. What is this doing? It's relating the final and initial velocities when we have an elastic collision, okay? It's a useful result, but again, it's only for elastic collisions. Okay, so um, the last thing to do here is just to reshuffle once again. If you look in the textbook, the way this is written is VA minus VB equals VB prime minus VA prime. It's the same exact equation, just with the terms moved around, okay? Um, so the standard way to write it is to kind of have like the, the non-prime stuff on one side and the prime stuff on the other side. So that's our final result, okay? So that's the algebra, that's where it came from. So to summarize, if you have this situation, 1D elastic collision uh, between two bodies, you can use this and it's going to make the problem actually solvable, okay? If you have to work with this equation right here, it's, it's kind of a nightmare, all right? So any questions on that? So the next thing I'm going to do you, uh, is, the next thing I'm going to do is show you an example of where we can use that equation we just derived, okay?
So here's what's going on. I have a puck with a mass of two kilograms, which is sliding along a flat and frictionless table at 12 meters per second. It collides head on with a stationary puck whose mass is six kilograms. So this is the two kilogram mass A, this is the six kilogram mass B. So let's assume that there is a perfectly elastic collision here, okay? So same kinetic energy before and after the collision, okay? The question is, what are the two final velocities for our two objects, okay? So basically here, I know VA, correct? VA, that's the velocity of A before collision, that's 12 meters per second, okay? What's VB, the velocity of B before collision? That would be zero because it's not moving. So there's two unknown velocities to solve for, which we call VA prime, VB prime for after collision. That's what we're trying to find here. Okay, so clear on that. All right, so here's what I know. I'm just gonna write it all down. MA is two kilograms. MB is six kilograms. Okay, VA, again, that's before collision, 12 meters per second. And VB, zero. What do we want to find out? We want to find VA prime and VB prime. That means we need two separate equations, okay? So what are the equations gonna be? One of them is just gonna be conservation of momentum. We've seen that a lot of times before. The other equation is gonna be the result that we just derived. If we put those two together, we can get two equations for the two unknown quantities. Okay, so actually I'm gonna start with um, the result we just derived. Because this collision is elastic, I know that VA minus VB equals VB prime minus VA prime. That's the exact result we just derived. What I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do with that is just plug in what we know and then leave what we don't know as a variable, okay? So I know VA, that's 12 meters per second minus VB, that's zero. That equals VB prime minus VA prime. So basically what I can do with this is I can sub out one of the velocities, okay? I could do this either way, but the way I'm gonna do it is say VB prime equals VA prime plus 12 meters per second, okay? So that's a useful substitution, so I can get rid of VB prime in the next equation I write down. Make sense? Okay, now, we also have momentum conservation. This says mass A times the initial velocity of A plus mass B times the initial velocity of B equals mass A times the final velocity of A, so we put a prime on that, remember? Plus mass B times the final velocity of B, right there. Okay, so now we're at a point where I can take this equation and plug in everything that I know. So for example, MA, that's two kilograms. VA, that's 12 meters per second. And then VB over here, remember that zero puck B starts off not moving. That just means that second term on the left side is just zero. All right, on the other side, here's what we have. MA, again, two kilograms. VA prime, we don't know it, so I'm gonna leave it alone. All right, now we have MB. That's six kilograms. And now we have VB prime. Well, I'm gonna use this result right here. I'm gonna use that substitution. That VB prime is just VA prime plus 12. Okay, 
So now we're at a point where the only unknown in this equation is VA prime, the final velocity for puck A. So we just have to do some number crunching, okay? On this side of the equation, what do we have? 2 times 12 equals 24. Also, check this out. Uh, I have kilograms in every single term, so I'm going to just cancel the unit of kilograms out across the board, okay? So now we have 2 times 12, 24 meters per second right there. What does that equal? Well, I'm going to have 2 times VA prime from this term, and then I'm going to have 6 times VA prime from this term right here, right? So add those together, right? 2 plus 6 is 8 times VA prime, okay? Then I'm going to have 6 times 12. Uh, what is 6 times 12? That's going to be 72. And the units that are coming along with that are meters per second, okay? So what I'm going to do next is subtract off 72 from both sides. Okay, so I'm going to have 24 minus 72. What's 24 minus 72? It's going to be something negative, right? All right, it's 48. Okay, so I have minus 48 meters per second equals 8 times VA prime. So we're just about ready to solve it. VA prime is negative 48 meters per second divided by 8. What does this give us for VA prime? Negative 6. That negative sign is important. It's telling us that puck A bounced back and it's moving in the opposite direction after collision. And finally, for VB prime, what am I going to do? I'm going to use this original substitution we came up with up here. We said VB prime equals VA prime plus 12. So I'll plug in minus 6 meters per second for VA prime, and then I'll add 12. And what does that give us? Six. Six, but positive, right? So we have positive six meters per second for B. So what does that tell us? Puck A comes in towards stationary puck B. They collide elastically. After they collide, they're moving off in opposite directions. A bounced back from the direction it was going, and B is going forward, but they're moving at the same speed, opposite directions, okay? Make sense? All right, so it's just a little algebra, but at the end of the day, you're just combining the familiar momentum equation with this newly derived equation, which only applies to elastic collisions, okay? So objects stick together, and it's not elastic. This equation doesn't even apply, okay? All right, so any questions so far? Okay, so the last thing I want to do here um, is do a sort of application for any of the people who have played pool out there, okay? Um, if you've ever played a game of billiards or pool, um, you've probably encountered this kind of situation, okay? So we have a billiard ball initially at rest on the table. That's the red ball right here. A second ball of equal mass, that's the cue ball over here, is going to collide with it head on. So we're not going to hit it on the side and make it go off at an angle. We're going to hit it head on. So it's all just one dimensional. Okay. Assume the collision is completely elastic. That's actually a pretty good assumption for uh, pool balls. They collide without losing much energy. Uh, so this is a pretty good assumption. Um, what we're going to show is that the two balls actually switch velocities after they collide. So in other words, if the red ball is initially at rest and the cue ball is initially coming in at, let's say, one meter per second, after they hit, they switch velocities. So now this one is at rest and this one's moving off at one meter per second, okay? You've all seen this kind of thing happen before. Here's what it looks like in the animation. They just switch velocities, okay? 
So what we're going to do is show that this is true. Okay. We're going to prove it using these two equations. Okay. Now, one thing that's really important as we do this is if you're dealing with billiard balls, they have the same mass. So it's different from the problem we just did where the two pucks had very different masses. When it comes to billiards, they have the same mass. And that's going to be important in uh, showing our result. Okay. So let's go through the math. Same starting points, right? We've got a momentum equation. This momentum equation says MA times VA plus MB times VB. So these are just A and B are the two different billiard balls colliding on the table. Uh, that's going to equal MA VA prime plus MB VB prime. But this time, we're going to simplify this equation using the fact that MA is equal to MB. Because again, in billiards, the, the balls will have the same mass. Okay? Um, so how can we simplify the equation in that case? The masses are the same. Just cancel out mass. Mass just cancels out across the board, right? Because A and B have the same mass. So now we're left with something kind of simple, which is VA plus VB equals VA prime plus VB prime. That's going to be true if you have two equal mass objects colliding. Okay? But what we also have is the fact that the uh, collision is elastic. All right? And we have the result from uh, the elastic collision that we worked out. I'm going to write it down. It says VA minus VB equals VB prime minus VA prime. These almost look like the same equation, but they're not, so you have to be careful with your notation, right? What I'm going to do is take these two equations and add them together. Sound good? So if we add these together, what happens? On this side, I get VA plus VA. So that's just two VA, right? Once they're added, here I get VB minus VB. So that's just zero, right? Those cancel when we add them together. All right, here I have VA prime minus VA prime. That's just zero, correct? And then I have VB prime plus VB prime, so that's two VB prime. But okay, I can cancel out those twos now, right? What am I seeing? I'm seeing that VB prime equals VA. So it's easy to get lost in the symbols here. In words, what this is saying is that the final velocity of the, the ball that we're labeling B is the same as the initial velocity of A. That means they switched velocities after they collided. You see that? So that is how we show with math this thing you know if you've played pool before, okay? Any questions on that? So switch velocities. All right, so we're gonna move on to something new now, but let me just pause, see if you have any questions before we do that. Is it all good? All right. So the next topic that I wanna get into with you guys is center of mass. And we're going to stay on this topic uh, for the rest of today, and we're going to finish it up uh, on Thursday. So this will be the last kind of new physics that you're going to learn about this semester, all right? Center of mass. And it is actually something that we'll come back to in Physics 45. Think of this as like your introduction to the topic, and you'll go into a lot more depth on it in 45, all right? We're all taking 45, right? Show of hands. I, only one person not taking it. Okay, so, so pay attention to this. This is important. Um, let's introduce the topic like this, okay? I'm going to show you a video. Uh, I'll explain what happens in the video. 
Someone's just gonna throw a baseball bat into the air and he's gonna throw it so that the bat is spinning as it moves through the air, okay? But there's some additional labeling on the video uh, that was put in after the fact and um, it tracks a certain point on the baseball bat. This is the one shown in red, okay? There's something kind of special about that point. So I'm gonna show you the animation or the video a few times. I want you to keep track of what the red point is doing when you watch it once. And then try to watch it again and then keep track of what a different point on the baseball bat is doing. Let's say like the handle of the bat, okay? And hopefully you'll notice that they move in different ways. There's something kind of special about the way the red point is moving, okay? So here, let's start by, I'll play it, try to focus your attention on like the handle of the bat right here. Just keep your eye on that point, tell me how it's moving. So what kind of path is that taking, the handle of the bat as it moves through the air? Is it just moving in a nice arc like this? Motion? Not for the handle, okay? If you actually trace out the path that the handle is taking, I'll, kind of, I'll try to sort of show you. It's going in a spiral like this. You see that? Okay? But if we take a look at another point on the bat, let's say like the top part, uh, it's actually doing the same thing, right? It's moving in sort of a spiral pattern as it moves through the air. But the red point is not doing that, right? The red point is moving in a nice, clean, parabolic trajectory, okay? So that's what makes the red point kind of special. It moves in a simpler way, right, than other points on the bat, okay? So as you can probably guess, that's what we call the center of mass of the bat. Okay, it's a special point which you can locate on any object, and it has this kind of special property where it's the point of rotation. It's the point that an object will rotate around if you just let it freely rotate by, let's say, chucking it into the air, okay? So, I'll say that again uh, in a kind of different way. What I want you to take away from looking at that video is that when it comes to how an object moves, okay, we really need to start dividing it into two parts, all right? One of those parts is what we call translation, okay? What it means when an object translates or undergoes translational motion is just that the object is moving from point A to point B without considering the way it might be spinning, okay? So in particular, when there's translation, it actually means the center of mass of the object is moving from point A to point B. So I'll define what the center of mass is later, but for now, just remember, it's a special point on the object. It moves. When it's moving, you have translation, okay? Now, what do we know about translation? We know a lot about it already because we've studied Newton's laws. All types of translational motion are pretty much governed by Newton's laws. If you want to understand how something is translating, you want to understand the forces that are acting on it, and you want to understand how you can apply Newton's laws to figure out how it moves, okay? So this is stuff we've already done. We've covered translation. Things like a block sliding down a ramp or the car accelerating down a highway, whatever. These are translational motion examples. On the other hand, we have rotation, which is not that the center of mass is moving, but that the object is actually spinning around its own center of mass, okay? So of course you can have rotation without translation. If you're just spinning in place, you're rotating, but you're not translating, right? So we're not gonna get into this in the class. Um, you're gonna learn about this in Physics 45, okay? But to give you a little bit of a preview, has anyone heard of the term torque before? Okay, it's not force that we are interested in when it comes to rotation as to what's causing things to move, it's actually torque. Torques are what cause rotation in physics, okay? And you're gonna learn about sort of a, a mirror image of Newton's laws that apply to rotation. So there's like an F equals MA type equation, but it's for rotation, okay? So, good so far, 
Any questions? So now let me tell you what the center of mass is and how to calculate it, because again, it's important in physics for dividing motion into translation and rotation. That's one aspect of it. So now let's talk about how to calculate it, okay? So here's the sort of picture you should have in your mind when it comes to calculating the center of mass. So like where on the object is the center of mass, that special point? Well, the way we want to think about this is a system of particles. I showed you this sort of sketch before, right? We have a bunch of different particles. You can have two, you can have billions of them, whatever it is. You just have some kind of system with a bunch of particles in it. And again, these can be like a bunch of independently moving objects, like the hockey pucks colliding on the table from the examples we saw. Or it can be like a solid object, right? I mean, because what is a solid object but a bunch of particles that are just bound together, okay? So we're being super general here, just a system of particles. All right, so of course we have an idea that there's a total mass in your system, okay? We're gonna use, just this is notation, big M for the total mass of our system. So that's little m1 plus little m2 all the way out to the last one, which we're going to call n sub n. So, for example, n would be 10 if we had 10 particles, n would be 100 if we had 100 particles. That's just how many we have, okay? So, big M is the total mass of everything. Little m is the individual masses of the particles, okay? That's the notation. So, in summation notation, remember this? That's how we're going to start writing things to keep it compact. Big N is just the sum from I equals one to N of M sub I, okay? What that's saying is take your mass and add them all together until you've reached the last one. That's, that's how you read that. All right, so that's pretty simple, right? Just add the masses up. Center of mass, let's get into that. The definition of center of mass in this kind of picture is like the average position of all the masses in your system, okay? Let's think about it, you know, this mass is over here, it has a certain position, this mass is over there, it has a certain position. I can talk about what the average position would be, right? Looks like it would be somewhere in the middle of all those masses. How do we normally take an average? Let me just ask you this. Like, if I were to ask you what the average height of everyone in the class is, how would you calculate it? Yeah, so you, you add together n heights, okay, where n is how many people are here, and then you divide by n, right? Okay, that's not the type of average we're doing when it comes to center of mass. We're doing something called a weighted average. What that means is that more massive particles count more, okay? So in other words, if I have two particles, a and b, if they have the same exact mass, the center of mass is right in the middle of the two particles, right? But if one has more mass, then the center of mass is closer to that one that's bigger, okay? So it's an average, but we're counting more the particles that have more mass, okay? So they, they count for more when we do the average. So the way this works is, we're not just adding the positions together. Remember, R is position. We're not just adding the R values together, dividing by N. Instead, we're gonna multiply each R value by a mass. So that you multiply a really tiny number for small masses so they don't count much. You multiply a really big number for big masses so they count more. That's the idea, okay? So I'm gonna take my first mass times R1, that's the position of that first mass, plus the second mass, times the position of that second mass, and then just do that until I've accounted for everything. And then instead of dividing by just a number, like 10 or whatever, I'm actually dividing out the sum of all the masses. So M1 plus M2, and so on. This is just how a weighted average works, okay? If we want to weight by mass, then everything gets multiplied by M. If you want to weight by something else, you multiply by that other thing, okay? So, that's kind of a 
messy expression. There's a more compact way to write it using summation notation. What does this say? This says RCM. That's the position of the center of mass. That's where the center of mass is located. That's what we want to calculate here. That's 1 over big M, because if you see here, we're just dividing out the total mass. So I'm just going to put 1 over big M as a factor out front. And then what are we doing other than that? Well, we're adding together a bunch of terms that look like this. M times R. That's mass times position. So I have MI, RI, added together from I equals 1 to M. Okay? So I know that might look a little weird or foreign at the, at the moment. We're going to do some examples for how you actually apply this. Okay? But any questions so far on the concept? So the center of mass is a weighted average of the positions of all the masses in your system. Okay, so next, here's what we're going to do. Um, I hope you recall from previous lectures that whenever you have an equation which involves vector quantities like position, right, you can write down a separate equation for each uh, direction. Like you have an x equation, y equation, z equation, and so on, right? That's still going to apply here. So, the way you want to think about it is, if I have my system of particles, put them right here, uh, and I want to know where the center of mass is, okay? Let's set up a coordinate system so I can calculate it. I have the x-axis going like this, the y-axis going like this. And let's say this point, which I mark with an x, is the center of mass, okay? So RCM, that's the position for that center of mass, goes from the origin of our coordinate system out to where that point is. Okay, that's what a position vector looks like, if you recall, okay? Position vectors just go from the origin out to wherever point you're talking about, okay? So the center of mass has like an x position, right? There's a location on the x-axis right here. It's an x-coordinate to it. It has a y-coordinate as well. And if we were in three dimensions, it'd have a z-coordinate, right? So there's like an x, y, and a z-coordinate for your center of mass. So how do we handle this? Usually, we just get each one individually, right? We calculate the x-coordinate for the center of mass, we calculate the y-coordinate, and the z-coordinate all separately. So here's how that works, okay? What we have in our original formula is a position, which we're calling R, right? That's just locating where an individual mass is. Like if I say R1, that might be this position, and R2 might be that position, and so on. So position is broken down into X, Y, Z. So for the X coordinate of our center of mass, we have 1 over big M times M, I, X, I. So I'm only putting the X coordinate in there, okay? For the y position of the center of mass, I have 1 over big M times sum from 1 to n, mi, yi. So I'm only putting the y coordinate in there. And then the same for z, okay? I'll tell you right away, in this class, I'm only going to give you two-dimensional problems where you need x and y, but if you needed the z component, that's how it would go, okay? So, I think we're ready to do an example. This is sounding kind of confusing. It's really not so bad to calculate this in, in a, a simple example like this one, okay? So here we have three masses, okay? I've got a mass of five kilograms sitting right here, 10 kilograms here, and two kilograms over here. What we're gonna find is the center of mass of the system. In other words, XCM, YCM. There's some location of the center of mass of the system. We're gonna give the X and Y coordinates for that, okay? So in order to do that, I need to know the X and Y coordinates of each one of these guys individually. So let's just go through it real quick. Let's label, going from left to right, let's label these one, two, and three, okay? So for particle number one, this guy right here, what are its X and Y coordinates? Yeah, this one is located at x equals 0, y equals 1, correct? For the second one, what are the x and y coordinates? 
That would be one, zero, right? X equals one, Y equals zero. What about for this last one? Two, one. Okay, two, one. Okay, so we have the coordinates of each one. We have the mass of each one. That's all you need to calculate the center of mass. We have all the information right there, okay? So let's go through it. So I'm going to start by writing down uh, what you guys just told me, which is for particle number one, that's the one uh, on, the, on the left side of the picture, that had a mass of 5 kilograms. And it was located at a position, which I'm going to call x1, comma, y1, of 0 and then 1 meter. All right, for particle number two, this was the one that had a mass of 10 kilograms. And we saw that it was located at position x2, comma, y2. That's equal to um, 1, 0, right? 1 meter uh, on the x-axis, 0 on the y-axis. And then finally, for this third guy, M3, which had a mass of two kilograms, what did we have? We had x3 comma y3 equals, the x coordinate was two, the y coordinate was one. All right, so that's all the info we need to do the calculation right there. Okay, so remember, if I want the x coordinate for the center of mass, this is the calculation we do. We say one, over big M, where that's the total mass of our system, times the summation of I equals 1 to N, M sub I, X sub I. Okay, so that's the kind of compact way to write it. I'm going to write it out in a more expanded way, which should be pretty clear once we put it on the page. So remember, um, on the bottom, what do we have? Big M, that's the total mass. So that's just going to be M1 plus M2 plus M3. That's just what's on the bottom. Do you agree? What's on the top? Well, it's mass times X coordinate for all of the particles added together. So that's M1 times X1 plus M2 times X2 plus M3 times X3. Well, we have all that data right on the page, okay? So let's just plug it in. What's M1? Starting here, what's M1? Five, Five kilograms. kilograms. Five kilograms, right? And what's X1? What's the X coordinate for that first mass? Zero. It's zero, so this first part is gonna be zero right there. Okay, what's M2? That's 10 kilograms. What's x2? That's one meter, right? And then finally, we have M3. M3, that's two kilograms. What's x3? Two meters. Okay. And then what do we do? We go to the bottom of this expression we add all the masses together. So we take 5 kilograms plus 10 kilograms plus 2 kilograms. And notice something that happens with the units. We have a unit of kilograms in every single term on both the top and the bottom. So that drops out. What are we left with? The units of meters. That's what we'd expect, right? Can someone crunch those numbers for me? Just give it to me in like decimal form. 0.824. Yeah. So that's half of the problem uh, because we want the x and the y coordinate of the center of mass. But you can probably see how it's going to work for the y coordinate now that you've seen this one, right? Basically, 
We're going to perform this same calculation. Uh, laser stud. Okay. Anyway, same calculation we did for x. Instead of x, we have y. Right? Y'all see that? So for the y coordinate of the center of mass, I'm going to take 1 over the total times summation 1 to n of mass i times now yi. So what that looks like is m1 y1 plus m2 y2 plus m3 y3 all divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3. Okay, so now we'll, we'll plug in the data we have. All right, I've got m1, that's five kilograms. What's y1? It goes here. One meter. One meter. Okay, then I have m2, that's 10 kilograms, times y2. What is y2? Zero. That's zero, right? And then I have m3, that's 2 kilograms. And then y3, what's that? That's 1 meter, right? So then we take that whole thing, and we divide it by the sum of all the masses, which is 5 kilograms plus 10 kilograms plus 2 kilograms. This works out in meters, just like before. And what, what is the uh, numerical value that we get? Yep, 0.412. So those are the x and the y coordinate of the center of mass for this system of three particles, okay? So it's really no different for other situations, right? We just look at all the particles, and if we know all their masses and where they're located, then we know where the center of mass must be located, okay? That's really the idea. So we good on this, any questions? Okay. Um, actually, let me go back. So yeah, we had x was 0.824, so that's like over here somewhere, and we had y is equal to 0.4. So our center of mass is roughly over here somewhere, okay? That's what we found. All right, cool. So I just showed you an example where we calculate the center of mass of three particles. Now, oftentimes what we want to know is not the center of mass of three particles, but some kind of, again, solid object, like a baseball bat that I showed you in the animation. So realistically, um, we don't want to take that solid object and break it down into all of its atoms and then do that sum over all of the atoms in that object, right? Like that's just not practical. How many atoms are we talking about in an object like this? It's like 10 to the 23rd power, right? I'm not going to add up 10 to the 23rd power terms. That's just not going to happen. So in physics 45, you're going to learn how to do this in a different way through integration, okay? And if you sort of turn this problem into a calculus problem, where you integrate over a smooth distribution of mass, um, what we had before as a summation is now an integral, where RCN is one over the total mass times integral R times DN. All right, we're not doing that in this class. You'll learn about it in physics 45. But one result that I will just tell you about, because it's useful, is if you have an object that has a uniform density, so it's just the same density all throughout the object, okay? Then the center of mass is literally in the center of the object, okay? So like if I have a, a ball that's made out of lead, uniform density, the center of mass is right in the middle of that ball, okay? If I have a cube, let's say, and it's uniform density, the center of mass is right in the middle of that cube, okay? It's only when you have non-uniform density, where like one part of the object is more dense than the other, that the center of mass is in a weird location you wouldn't expect, okay? 
So any questions on that? All right. So I want to give you one to try out. An interesting calculation we could do is let's consider the sun and the earth together. That's our system. So where is the center of mass of the Earth-Sun system? Here's some data that's going to go into this. The Earth and the Sun are approximately 93 million miles away. So what I want you to imagine is the center of the Sun and the center of the Earth, 93 million miles from each other. Okay? That's 93 times 10 to the 6 miles. The masses, I'm going to give those to you. The Earth has a mass of 5.97. 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the sun has a mass of 1.99, 10 to the 30 kilograms. So the sun is much, much more massive. Remember how I said center of mass is like a weighted average, things that are more massive count more? Again, if the earth and the sun had the exact same mass, then the center of mass would be right in the middle. But in this case, is it gonna to be to the left or to the right of that? Yeah, it's going to be way closer to here. In fact, it's going to be inside of the sun, as it turns out. Okay? So what I want you to do is calculate where the center of mass is. How far from the middle of the sun is that center of mass point. Okay? Take a few minutes so you can do the calculation. Let's go ahead and do the next one. Okay, so I went around the room. I think a lot of you already have this, which is good to see. Um, I think one thing that's missing, though, is, a, is sort of a picture. I think a lot of you just knew how to do the calculation right off the bat, which is great. But here's how I would draw the picture just so it's clear. We have the sun here, label it S, and we have the earth here, label it E. Okay, not to scale, obviously. Let's put a coordinate system on top of that picture, okay? Let's put, let's say, an x-axis going this way. How about we put the origin right where the sun is, at the center of the sun, because that's where we want to measure from, by the way, okay? And that means the center of the Earth over here is at an x-coordinate of 93, 10 to the 6 miles. So again, there's a center of mass somewhere in between the Earth and the Sun. We're trying to figure out where it is in terms of x, right? We're trying to calculate xcm. Let me remind you how this goes. It's 1 over the total mass times the summation 
uh, from i equals 1 to n of m sub i x sub i, okay? But there's only two things we're summing over here, right? Just earth and the sun. So I'll write it in the following way. I'll write it as mass of the sun times the x coordinate of the sun plus the mass of the earth times the x coordinate of the earth divided by the total mass, which is just mass of the sun plus mass of the earth. Okay, that's, that's what it is. So, XCM, uh, let's plug in the data. What is my first term on top gonna equal? It's zero, because I, I put the sun at the origin. So, whatever the mass is, I'm multiplying it by an X value of zero, okay? And then what's the mass of the Earth? That's 5.97, 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. And then the X coordinate of the Earth is just how far it is from the Sun. That's 93 times 10 to the 6 miles. All right, so now we want to divide that by the total mass, which is M Sun is 1.99, 10 to the 30 kilograms plus 5.97 10 to the 24 kilograms. All right, so what do we get? What's the answer? 279 miles. Yeah, it's only 279 miles. Um, that is, we take a look at the sun and the earth as a system in itself, then the center of mass of that system is just 279 miles away from the center of the sun. So it's almost right in the center of the sun for all practical purposes, because the sun is just that much more massive than the earth, okay? So it's very, very heavily biased towards the sun, okay? Any questions on that? We good? Okay. So... <clears throat> You know what the center of mass is? You know how to calculate it? Um, next, let's go through a useful result. So center of mass is important for a lot of different reasons. Some of those reasons you'll learn about in this class. Some you'll learn about in 46, or sorry, 45. Um, but I wanna give you one of those results today before we leave. So um, if you look at that equation at the top of the screen, it looks familiar, it looks like F equals MA with some extra stuff going on. Um, so basically, this can be thought about as Newton's second law, not for just one particle. If we have just one particle, we think of it as just F equals MA. This is how you apply Newton's second law to a whole system of particles, okay? So looking at all the particles all together, um, this is what it would look like. So what does the equation say? Let's first look at that. This says that the net external force acting on your system, so the total outside force acting on your system, is equal to big M. Remember our notation says big M is the total mass of all the things in your system, times ACM. So this is the acceleration of the center of mass, okay? In particular, it's the acceleration of the center of mass, not any other point. So the net external force determines how the center of mass is going to accelerate, okay? And this is sort of the governing equation for all types of translational motion, okay? Because remember, when it comes to translation, it basically is how the center of mass is moving from point A to point B uh, that we care about. All right, and let's look at a special case. If we have a system where there's no outside force acting, the total external force is zero, that immediately tells us that the other side of the equation, ACN, is equal to zero, okay? So if you have no outside forces, then your center of mass is not accelerating. That's the takeaway from that, okay? So I'm gonna show you where this comes from. We're gonna do a little bit of a derivation here, okay? So 
Again, we want to start thinking about not just one particle, but a system of particles. So the kind of generic picture is this. I'll draw what's called our system boundary. So everything in that boundary is part of our system. And we have some number of particles in here. It could be two, could be 20 trillion, could be any number of particles in our system, okay? Now, for each particle individually, okay, so just pick any one of these particles out, we have Newton's second law holding true, right? So when I write this, what I'm saying is, if I look at any one of these particles, if I take the sum of all the forces acting on it, that's going to be the mass of that particle times the acceleration of that particular particle. Okay, so that's just for one. But what I can do with that is come up with the total force on all particles. So what does that mean? It means take all the forces acting on particle one, add them together, take all the forces acting on particle two, add those together, and so on. Just do that until you've included everything. So I'll just say dot, dot, dot. And what does that equal? Well, for particle one, this term is the mass, which I'll call M1, times the acceleration, which I'll call A1. Okay, for particle two, it's M2 times A2. And then dot, 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 right? So F equals MA holds true for each one individually, but when we add them together, we get kind of a giant sum on each side, okay? So here's what we're gonna do next. I did this before uh, when we talked about momentum, uh, but I'm gonna do this kind of trick again. See, when I look at the forces acting on these particles, I can basically divide it into two parts. We have internal forces and external, right? Remember, internal forces, that would be whatever force is occurring between two particles in the system, so like these two exert a force on each other, that would be internal. If the force is coming from outside, that would be external. That's the difference. So what I'm gonna do is say, take all those forces and just group them into external and internal. Make sense? All right, so next, I wanna remind you of something we can do on this side of the equation. Okay, acceleration. What does it mean when something accelerates? What's like a good definition for acceleration? Its velocity is increasing. It's a lot, yeah, or its velocity is changing more generally, right? It's actually the derivative of velocity, if you remember. It's also the second derivative of position, okay? You guys remember that? Acceleration is the second derivative of position. I'm just gonna write it like that in each one of these A terms. So we have M1, times the second derivative of the position of particle one. So that's just the second derivative right there. And then we have M2 times the second derivative of position for particle two. And that just keeps going, right? So I'm just re-expressing all the accelerations as second derivative of position. Okay. You guys remember from the last time we were doing something like this, I have external and internal forces. One of these is gonna to go to zero. Which one? Oh, it's not the external. Yeah, so the internal forces have to go to zero. I'm not gonna explain this as much, in as much detail as the last time because we did this before. But this is basically because um, of Newton's third law. For every internal force, there's gonna be an equal and opposite force exerted by another particle so that the whole sum just cancels out, gives you zero, okay? So, now we're just left with this. 
the net external force equals that whole thing, which I'm going to slightly rewrite in, in just a different way. Okay, see, we're taking the second derivative in every single term on this side of the equation. So I'm just going to write that with the second derivative being taken out to the front. So it's the second derivative of this whole thing, m1, r1. See, that's what I get from the first term. And then m2, r2, that's what I get from the second term. And just keep going until you've included everything. That's what we have. All right? I'm hoping if you've been paying attention, this thing looks kind of familiar. The mass times position all added together. What does that kind of look like? Okay. That would be mass times velocity. Center of mass, right? But kind of slightly different here. Let's let's compare this to what we have for center of mass. For center of mass, we have one over the total mass of in summation i equals one to n of m sub i r sub i. So th that's what's over here is the sum of m times r. So that means what's in the brackets, okay? I'm just going to say what's in the brackets up here is equal to big M times RCM. You see that? If I just take the big M over here and I get this sum which is in the brackets, okay? So in other words, we have the net external force acting on the system is equal to second derivative of big M times RCM. And what I'll do is I'll take the big M and pull it out. So we have big M times the second derivative of RCM with respect to time. So now, if you look at that thing, the second derivative of the position of the center of mass, that's the acceleration of the center of mass, okay? So that's where M times ACM equaling the total external force comes from, okay? That's the result. I want to show you where it came from. It's important to understand the logic, but what we're going to do basically from here on out until the end of the week is applications of this, examples of how we can use this idea. Right now, maybe seems a little abstract. Hopefully, once you've seen a few examples, you'll start to understand what this is really saying, okay? But I think we don't have time for that today, so we'll pick up where we left off on Thursday.